Life Over Coffee, Conversations for Transformation. Hello, everyone. Rick Thomas here. Thank you so much for joining me. I am working through my book, Sex, Temptation, Modesty, something like that. It's the title. You can find it in our store at lifeovercoffee.com, and I, I would encourage you to get a free copy. And then, well, as always, let 1,000 of your closest friends know about this book. It is free. There is no catch, and I think it will be so helpful because this is such an important subject. I want to work through one of the chapters in that book here, and I trust it will benefit you. I trust it will motivate you to want to get the entire book, not only read it, but to discuss it with among friends and, of course, let other people know. What I want to talk about here is this idea that, that men are, are tempted to be or, or tempted to lust, rather, and that women are tempted to be lusted after. And, and, I, and I do think it's important that we level the playing field because, again, the temptation can be to place all of this in the lap of, of one gender, specifically men. And there's no doubt that men are tempted to, to lust. But as I was sharing in a previous chapter, I was talking about a backward porn addiction where a humble lady came to me and, and she said, well, you know, this is not just my husband's problem, but it is mine too, uh, that I enjoy capturing the gaze of men. She was so humble and so honest about uh, that problem that she had. And of course, God did a remarkable work of grace in her heart. But I know that the temptation would be, it would be simpler just to place lust in the problem as a problem in the lap of one gender. But it would bring harm to God's Word because lust is every person's temptation. By the way, yours may not be pornography. It may not be sexuality, what I'm talking about here. But it's something. You struggle with something. I mean, maybe it would be better to use a couple of synonyms for lust to help level the playing field that we would holster our tongues to be quick to listen and slow to speak, that we won't be like that person that goes, ready, fire, aim, and that we would react more soberly and, and consider the wisdom in the sequence. The sequence is the log and the speck. You remember what Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, that we always want to address the log in our eye before we go speck fishing. Well, I was thinking about these things when I received this letter from a friend, and I'm going to share this letter with you, and, and this will be the foundation to what I want to talk about over the next few moments. Dear Rick, I have gone through the trauma of discovering that my husband was viewing pornography. I thought it was a problem that only involved explicit material. I never knew or even thought that any improperly dressed woman was tempting him to sin. Then he began confessing to me that he was lusting after any woman on the street our church, even our family magazines, those who expose themselves with inappropriate clothing. I was shocked and horrified. The pain and suffering we went through were the worst things that's ever happened to me. By the way, God healed me of cancer. The saddest thing of all was that I never knew how men looked at women or what they thought when they looked at women. Knowing this broke my heart. I never knew how the clothing of a woman affected the men around me. My husband never told me how it affected him. I followed the secular way of clothing myself without realizing how I was contributing to the problem. Bikinis, shorts, cleavage, and tight-fitting jeans that accentuate lower body parts, all were some of the things that tempt men to lust and sometimes to yield to that temptation. Can you see how deceived I was? Worst of all, I thought I, I never looked like them, those who were unashamedly trafficked in porn. I was under the impression that my clothing was tasteful and sophisticated. I was completely oblivious to what effect I had or affected the men and the women around me. Call me naive, but ever knew, I never knew that our fathers, our husbands, our brothers, our pastors lusted after women. I thought it was only the unsaved and the perverted people who really needed Jesus. But it was in my church, my home. It was in my marriage. My appeal is to our leaders, our husbands and fathers to help us, to protect us, to lead us. Tell us what it is about our unacceptable clothing. Tell us why it's unacceptable. Tell us what it's all about. 
Tell us how we can cause men to stumble. Tell us what is happening in the minds of the men around us. If you will speak honestly to us and love us enough to tell us the truth about porn, many wives and daughters will be grateful and willing to humble themselves into more God-centered ways of thinking and dressing. Many husbands are not leading their wives this way. Many mothers are not modeling modesty to their daughters. I fear for the next generation of wives, mothers, daughters, who will be even more naked than they are now. The enemy deceives us into thinking that pornography and the media, it is the problem. We women, mostly through our ignorance, have become part of the problem, and nobody seems to be willing or prepared to speak openly about it. I thank God Almighty for the power of the blood of Jesus that took my husband out of bondage and restored our marriage. Now I dress very attractively for my husband in private. The moment we leave our home, I change into a modern, trendy lady, but not a sexy one. This, problem work, uh, this process works very well for us. When you dress sexy in public, you will be dressing sexy for the public. I don't want to be an object of lust. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. I title this letter Mabel. Mabel is not her name. And it did remind me of Galatians 6 where Paul says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now let me give you a, a warning. If you interpret what I'm sharing here as an attempt to blame a man's lust problem on women, then you misinterpreted what I am sharing with you. And I appeal to you to ask God to provide you with the clarity that you need to discern the point that is being made here, the point that Mabel painfully articulated. Each person is entirely responsible for the sin that they commit. Nobody is allowed to blame their sin on, on others, on circumstances, or as a byproduct of living in a fallen world. Porn is a two-way street. It takes two people to engage in porn. The guy who is seeking a sexual object to satisfy his lust and a woman who wants to be the object of his lust. If you remove either participant, and porn would struggle to survive. But typically, when people think about porn, they quickly jump to the perverted guy problem, which is only half of the equation, which is why Mabel, the wife of a porn addict, wrote to me. She made a vigorous and compelling appeal for me to talk about the other side of the porn problem, the gaze capturers. And so before I proceed, I am compelled to want to ask you a question. When I say porn, or when I say pornography, what comes to your mind? I asked my wife this question, and she said, naked women. She didn't jump to the perverted guy problem, but she talked about women with no clothes on. What she conveyed is the other misunderstanding about the porn problem. That is only about naked women found on the internet, adult movies, or porn magazines. Thinking that porn is only a perverted guy problem or a naked lady problem, it not only narrows the interpretation of porn to something that misses a vital detail, but it reduces the Bible's impact on the real issue. To understand the real issue, you have to go deeper than the outward manifestation of the problem, the dude looking or the woman unclothed. Looking below the surface is how we address all of our problems. We begin in the heart before we address the behavior, which is why the Bible starts at the root of porn rather than its fruit. Jesus said it this way in 528 of Matthew. I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You cannot get into porn without first lusting for porn, which begins in the heart. Porn participation is the overflow of lust-filled hearts. 
Thus, understanding the underlying heart issue, it not only broadens the scope of porn, but it's an alarming warning to women everywhere that millions of husbands, fathers, brothers, leaders, pastors are tempted to lust, even if they've never looked at porn. James gets at the heart of the matter when he says in chapter 1, 14 and 15, that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, his own lust. Then desire, when it has conceived, it gives birth to sin or to porn. And sin or porn, when it fully brings for it fully uh, fully grown, it brings forth death, death like relational dysfunction. A lady in a church building on Sunday morning is better than that's her being on the set of an X-rated production, but her church building is not impervious to the encroachments of lust. Her role is her role in our ubiquitous battle against the entanglements of lust is just as essential in the sanctuary as it is at the swimming pool. Any woman is a potential lust magnet that can attract a guy because this kind of sensual temptation does not isolate itself on the internet, on a a stage where people are acting out pornography. Unlike the alcoholic who can take another route to work rather than driving by the liquor store every morning, lust is harder to escape. And so after you reframe the conversation from the behavioral problem that it most certainly is to a deeper heart issue, then you'll be able to perceive how much bigger it is while being able to fortify yourself in the fight. This lady, the letter that I was reading to you, she began to understand that this problem is a lot bigger than what our eyes see and what's on the internet. This heart, this this problem is in our heart, and it is much deeper. And so without dismissing or minimizing the man's temptation to lust or removing all the responsibility he deserves when he acts out on that temptation, it is just as important to give adequate time to the other side of this problem. Women enjoy being lusted after, being observed and they hope someone will find them attractive. You see, God put an attraction gene in both the male and the female. In Genesis 1 and 2, the concept of looking at a girl and being liked by a guy, that was God's design. Adam was the pursuer. Eve was what he wanted, and it was good. And then the man and the woman fell hard in the garden. Sin opened Adam's eyes in ways that he could never have imagined before. And Eve walked in her, unique to her darkness. They both enjoyed their versions of perversion. Adam wanted Eve for self-serving purposes. Eve desired Adam to pursue her for self-serving purposes. Eve's sin is why women are easily tempted to seduce or manipulate a man. For for some women, it is because they enjoy the tantalizing power that they can exert over a guy. I am sure this is not an odd thought to you, especially if you contextualize that desire within the feminist movement. You see, feminists like Eve, they, they hate the role of submission, which is why they rebelled like their predecessor. I don't want to be submitted to Adam. Do you believe this temptation to manipulate or to gain power is exclusive to the feminist lobby? There are millions of women who love God, but sin tempts them to manipulate the opinions of others by how they present themselves to others. These women are gaze capturers. These women like the power that they have over others. Are you a gaze capturer? Do you secretly enjoy the power? It's a perverse security, by the way, that power. That you feel when people notice you. Do you secretly enjoy the ability to control, to manipulate? That itself is a perverse security. By manipulating them by your beauty. Just as darkness filled Eve's godly desire to be pursued... 
and enjoyed by Adam at the dawn of sin, a postmodern godly woman can also be tempted by the pleasure that lust offers her and the power that it promises. More than likely, you have not posed in a pornographic magazine or starred in a pornographic movie. However, do you believe you are less guilty than the woman who does if you dress in a way that tempts a man to sin after you? Now, certainly, you may be less guilty from a consequential perspective. Yes. But if you dress in a way that tempts a man to sin, you are minimally acting as a conduit that feeds his lust until he can find more explicit satisfaction somewhere else. Like the lady who wrote to me, you can unwittingly cooperate with the porn person by the way that you dress. My appeal would be for you to guard your heart against thinking the porn queen is the only problem in the battle against lust. It is possible for a church-going, God-loving woman to play a role in lust victories. And I am not your judge. And I would appeal to you to talk to your husband, your father, your pastor's wife, your small group leader's wife, or some other godly person who is willing to speak into your life in a loving way. But if you are not dressing in a way that is alluring or tempting or manipulating or seducing or gaze-capturing, then you have nothing to worry about, nothing to be mad about, and you have nothing to change. However, if you were, wouldn't it be great to know now? I mean, wouldn't humility motivate a Christ-centered response from you? I realize that this brings up a, a whole other set of problems in the Christian community. And, and so let me ask about one of those problems. How are people caring for you? Who who is talking about these things? In Proverbs 27, 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. One of the sadder observations that I have seen in the Christian community is the lack of loving courage that is required to bring the corrective care that this kind of problem demands. The proverbial faithful friend is more of an anomaly than a ubiquitous reality. Sadly, when there is corrective care, it happens with harshness and carelessness rather than restorative love that leaves the person built up in the faith. Individuals freed by the gospel act like the gospel. In the context of this discussion, there are two essential characteristics of this kind of gospel care and freedom. The caregiver brings corrective care care in a spirit of gentle love that is courageous, compassionate, complete, and constructive. And number two, the care receiver wants their corrective care because the gospel has delivered them from the desire to hide, to fear, to self-protect. If either one of those two conditions does not happen, the corrective caregiver and the the corrective care receiver, then friends will not be faithful to each other. Which brings us to two important questions. Are you freed by the power of the gospel to be a faithful friend to someone? Are you freed by the power of the gospel to ask a faithful friend to evaluate your clothing choices? If you are free to ask a friend for help, then you may press the point further by sharing some of your darker temptations with that person. Make it easy for them to care for you. Rather than expecting them to ask you the perfect question, you can circumvent this potential pitfall in caregiving by being proactive through self-disclosure rather than what it will do is it would actually release them from having to land the perfect question. Sometimes we do that to our friends. Well, you didn't ask me the right question. That's why I did not give you the answer. Let's don't play those mind games. Mabel said, Most of us women are not even sure what is inappropriate anymore. We have given over to following the media, fashion gurus, and Hollywood. One of the more significant tensions in the modesty wars is our misunderstanding of what it means to look desirable. 
usually the point of focus gets hung up on the word desirable, as in, are you saying I should not look desirable? I mean, most certainly it's a good thing to look desirable. I mean, you want someone to desire you. Uh, that is living according to how God designed you. He made Eve desirable, and Adam desired her. To be undesirable could be a hindrance to the gospel's effectiveness. We would run from each other if we were all undesirable. The real issue here is not about being desirable, but about whose authority you are going to submit to as the definers of what is desirable. It is a sad commentary on the church that our culture is doing the trend setting within the church. The only people in the world with the right answers about modesty should be setting the pace and establishing the trends, at least within our Christian culture. Let me ask you a few questions about this idea. And again, if you want to read this chapter, I would encourage you to go to lifeovercoffee.com. Get my book, uh, Sex, Temptation, and Modesty is something like that. Uh, I can't remember all the titles. We have so many, but this is one of the chapters. And the long-form title of this chapter is that, that men are tempted to, to lust and women are tempted to be lusted after. And it's an honest discussion, and it's what I appreciated about the letter that I shared with you in the beginning. It was eye-opening for this woman, and this woman had enough God about her. She had enough humility to not only be angry with her husband because he was lusting after women, but she began to understand that maybe this problem is a lot bigger than I ever anticipated, as she so clearly explained. And that's the kind of humility that we, want, we all want. We don't want to be blaming the other gender as though this is not a sinful contagion among all of us and we all have a personal responsibility even though it acts out differently between male and female. So here's a question for you to ponder. When you think about the porn problem, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Perverted men, naked women, or something else? You remember I was, I was sharing earlier, I, I asked my wife that when you think about pornography, what do you think about? She said naked women. Some people would think perverted men. And, and that is usually one or two places where the conversation hangs out exclusively. But we have to think deeper about this problem. It is in our hearts. And all of us have a sense of shame. All of us feel a sense of insecurity to different degrees. And depending on our Christian maturity, well, that will be the degree in which we struggle. Some of you have been walking with Christ for a long time and you have overcome some of these Adamic tendencies. But these tendencies are in all of us. And maybe it has nothing to do with pornography, immodesty, sexual temptation. Maybe it's our children. It is the woman who is hung up on how she looks in her church based on how her children are doing. This is a similar idol here. I care what you think about me and because of the way my children present myself, that will determine whether I feel good about myself or not. Do you hear the insecurity in her soul? No, it's not about looking pretty and, and temptation to pornography and, and that type of thing and capturing the gaze of, of other men. This woman is not doing that. But she wants you to capture, she wants her children to capture the gaze of other people, and if her children are performing according to her expectations, then her idol is stroked. This is a deeper problem that works out in a multiplicity of ways. Here's another question. Have you considered the source of porn, which is lust from the heart? Why is it vital to reflect on this problem at its source? I trust you could answer that question by now. And so the lady who is into reputation management, specifically on how her children are performing in front of the other people at the church, where she is absolutely devastated if one of her children goes off the reservation, goes off the rails, is not walking with God anymore, then she is humiliated because her strength is tied to how her children are performing. That is a lust of the heart that has nothing to do with pornography, but it's the same idol that's manifesting in a different way. That is why we have to address the problem 
at its source, at its cause, which is always in the heart. Question number three. Do you realize how you cannot confine lust to the porn industry? I was talking about how women dress uh, in the church. We, we have a, a, there's a temptation among some of us to ca categorize some of the sin that we, we see. And we can smugly look down on other people because we don't struggle in the more perverted ways. Now, I am not making a consequential argument. Obviously, there are some sins that are more consequentially devastating than others. But what we want to be careful is that we don't compartmentalize our sin in such a way that we can feel better about ourselves because ours is not as explicit, not as consequential, not as perverted as the more unrefined sins that we see in our culture. And so this is not a consequential argument. And so we want to make sure that we don't confine lust just to the porn industry and it only acts out in one way. Again, going back to the lady whose reputation is tied to the performance of her children, she is lusting and it is a significant idol and she is breaking the first commandment because she has set up another God in her heart and his name is not Jehovah. Question number four. Because lust is omnipresent, what is your responsibility in fighting against its encroachments? And so what I trust by this question here is that the humble Christian will think how lust operates in their heart. We don't want to get into the comparison game. Again, we don't want to look across the room and say, well, that person struggles in a way that I don't, so I can feel superior to them. No, we want to ask God without going into morbid introspection to where we're just navel-gazing and despairing. No, we are optimistic. We have confidence because greater is He that's in us than He is in the world. He who overcame the world can overcome our sin. And so we enter into our sinful examinations with optimism and confidence because we know there is grace for that. And so we don't look inside of ourselves to address things that are wrong with us and it drives us to despair. If it is, that means that, well, you're not doing that from a God-centered perspective, but you really despise yourself and how you are. And it's more about you rather than the victory that we can have in Christ. But we have to recognize that lust is um present, and it acts out differently in all of our lives, and so we want to address those differences. Number five, because lust is omnipresent, what specific way do you lust? Think about your cravings, your sinful desires, things that have more control over your thoughts than Sovereign Lord. You could take this completely out of a porn conversation. A sensuality conversation for those of you who are given over to worry, anxiety, fear. For those of you who struggle with anger, uh, perhaps that is how your lust works out and those thoughts have you captive. Our most powerful sin pattern, by the way, is self-righteousness. Maybe that is the problem that we're talking about here, where we look down on other people. Therefore, we're talking about criticism. We're talking about condemnation. We're talking about gossip. If you have a critical spirit, then the lust that you have is an exaltation of yourself, your own superiority. You can only look down on other people from a lofty perch. And so if self-righteousness is the lust of your heart, well, then again, we're not talking about a porn problem necessarily, but we're talking about a self-righteous heart because it's easy to compare ourselves to other people. And so... I trust that the Holy Spirit of God would identify whatever it is in your heart that needs to be identified so that we can be humble before each other, address the specific, unique to us lust problems. In the context of this podcast and the video that I have uh, produced here, we're talking specifically about pornography, immodesty, lust, sensual, sensuality, and temptation. If you want a fuller treatment of it, and, and I hope that you do, then I would encourage you to go to lifeovercoffee.com and get my entire book, download it, and share it with a friend. This is an issue. For those of you who have children, you know it is. We give them phones, and they go on these platforms, and they have raw, immediate access to some of the darker perversions that we have ever seen in our, in our entire lives in a matter of seconds. Uh, they can see in one hour more than what two generations prior to them have ever imagined 
or have never seen in their entire lives. And that's where we live. And that's why this conversation is so important. So go to lifeovercoffee.com and, and get that book. Let me make one other appeal that our resources are free. The book that I'm giving away took hours and hours, I don't know how many hours, scores of hours to produce, to write, to rough out, uh, to finish, to put in podcasts and videos to give away. Thousands of dollars it takes to, uh, for each book. This is my 12th one that's in our store at this time. And so we're giving away tens of thousands of dollars of material resources because we believe that the content is that good. And we're passionate about it, and we want it to reach as many people as possible. But what we don't have are investors in this ministry. And we need people to, that believe in what we're doing, they like our content, and they're able to invest at a significant amount. Local churches supporting us. We are a missional ministry. Every day we go around the world giving our content away. It's a phenomenal thing. Our shop never closes. We're a 24-7 shop because we're on the internet. We reach hundreds of thousands of people every year providing this free content. And so if you have the ability uh, to support our ministry, to invest in it, please reach out to us. Uh, let's have a conversation. We're going to continue to do what we do by the grace of God, but there is a human responsibility in that. We're doing our part by producing as much as we can, as fast as we can, a high-quality product that really gets to the heart of our problems, but we cannot do that alone. And so if you're able to come alongside us and to invest in what we're doing, ask God about that and then talk to us and let's see if we can uh, make something happen so that we can continue to produce even more better content to reach more people with the practical message of Christ. Thanks for joining us. Learn more and get access to other resources at lifeovercoffee.com.